has Putin achieved its security goals in Ukraine and beyond Ukraine in Europe? How do you see the conflict right now? Well, let's put it this way. The goals and objective of the West in engaging in this conflict in Ukraine, and remember, this is a war that the West chose to do, not, not Russia. It was forced upon Russia. Um, the goal of this entire endeavor since 2014, I one could say since 2008, with the expansion of uh, NATO to include Ukraine, uh, was to undermine the rule of Russian President Vladimir Putin and to eventually remove him from power. They have failed. Vladimir Putin today is a wartime leader who enjoys nearly 80% approval rating. Um, he just announced that he'll be running for re-election in March. Nobody will beat him. He's invincible as a leader. Um, the Russian people believe in him. They trust him. They want him. Um, and and so, you know, the, the, the idea of a weakened Vladimir Putin um, somehow looking for the West to throw him a bone in terms of bringing it into this conflict is absurd. Russia has won this war. I mean, there's still some fighting left to do. I always point out to people that um, the Allies went across the beach at Normandy in June of 1944 um, and then drove through, captured Paris, and we got to the uh, border with uh, with Germany. We knew what the future held. Uh, Germany was strategically defeated. They had one last gasp with the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes Offensive. Uh, that failed, and that failure ate up all of Germany's reserves. They had nothing left. And we knew that in January of 1945. We crossed the Rhine River. We drove into the, the Ruhr uh, Valley. We, we, we were entering into Germany. It was all over. By April 1st, there was no debate how this war was going to end. The bloodiest month for the United States against Nazi Germany in World War II was April 1945. It was bloodier than D-Day. It was bloodier than the Battle of the Bulge. The last month of Nazi Germany's existence was the bloodiest month for American forces because the Germans were fighting for their survival. For their, you know, the, the, the Nazis were, it was, a, it was literally a death struggle. Um, Russia has won this war. There's no way to, that this can be made otherwise. There's nothing the collective West can do in terms of providing Ukraine with money or material that can change this outcome. Russia has won. That doesn't mean that the fighting's over. There's still plenty of fighting left. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be easier for Russia going forward. The last month of this war could be the bloodiest month for Russia. We don't know. But the point is, um, Ukraine cannot win. They cannot win. It's over for Ukraine. And Russia knows this. And more importantly, I think Ukraine knows this and the West knows it. Uh, right now, the West is in the position not of trying to viably help Ukraine, but to posture so that it's seen that they're trying to do everything they can for Ukraine while letting Ukraine die. Um, that we're, we're in a phase of this, the political phase of this conflict, where the United States and NATO and Europe are trying to shift blame for the failure of their Russian policy onto the shoulders of Ukraine. And this just, again... Uh, proves a point I've always made, that the West has never cared about Ukraine, ever, not once. We never wanted them to win. We never expected them to win. All we wanted them to do is do harm to Russia, significant military harm to Russia, which when it when you added that to the economic collapse of Russia because of Western sanctions, could lead to a, Mice, a Moscow Maidan moment where Russians threw Vladimir Putin out of power. That's always been the objective. It was never about a Ukrainian victory, ever. We don't care about Ukraine. What part of 500,000 dead don't, doesn't anybody understand? What part of 10 to 20 million displaced? a trillion dollars in infrastructure. What part of that implies that we care about Ukraine? Because no friend would ever allow that to happen to their friend. Ukraine is not our friend. Ukraine is a tool that we have been using to bring harm to Russia. That tool has been worn out. It's become ineffective. And it's now time for us to dispose of this tool. We are disposing of Ukraine. That's what we're in the process of doing. It's uh, disgusting. Look, I've 
never taken Ukraine's side in this conflict, and I never will. But I just have to say, as an American, it's embarrassing as hell to watch what my government is doing. I mean, I've never been supportive of their policy, but my God, as an American, when your government says they're going to do something, you'd like to believe that the government has the gravitas to 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 complete what it set out to do. But it, it, it appears that America stands for nothing, stands for nothing, especially when we talk about, you know, with Ukraine, we'll be with there with you till the end. Well, apparently we will, but we're digging the grave and we're going to bury the body. Um, that's not friendship. Uh, and I hope the Ukrainian people are, are are finally realizing this and recognizing the need to bring it into this war because we're not going to save them. The cavalry will not come riding over the hill. Uh, Ukraine is going down. There is nobody to rescue them. There is nobody to save them except the Russians. And it's time they turn their fate and their future over to Russia by bringing it into this conflict on terms acceptable to Russia. And if one takes a look at the terms that Russia was putting forward back in 2022, they were extraordinarily fair, extraordinarily fair. And I would imagine that Russia will have fair terms now, too. I mean, they're not going to give up the territories that uh, they've absorbed. That won't happen. But if Ukraine acts promptly to bring it into this conflict, Ukraine may not lose other territories. I don't know if it's too late for Odessa. When you turn Odessa into a platform to attack Crimea, to threaten the Black Sea Fleet as Ukraine has done, I think Russia is well within its rights to say that Odessa and the Black Sea coast can never again be trusted to uh, a sovereign Ukraine, that Russia's national security uh, dictates that it controls that coastline, that city. Again, only Russia gets to make that decision, but I... I think that Russia may have decided that one of the terms for ending this war is that Ukraine loses sovereignty over Odessa and the Black Sea, and that this may become part of Novoya Russia. But again, only Russia can make that that case. But um, you know whether or not they lose Kharkov, whether or not they lose uh, Dnepropetrovsk, you know there might be a chance for Ukraine to retain um, you know territory. Um, but they have to stop this war now. And I don't know if they're ready to do that yet. We've heard some rumors about Zeluzhny negotiating with Russians behind the scene. In your opinion, was that real? It was all made up? How did you find it? Well, it's interesting. Um, first of all, under what authority would Zeluzhny be negotiating? Because no negotiation, uh, a negotiation void of Authority isn't a negotiation. It's just words. It's a conversation. It's nothing. Zeluzhny, you know, I think you're referring to a article uh, published by Seymour Hirsch in his Substack. You know, for Zeluzhny to have a a, a conversation with Gerasimov, uh, whom that's who the article said he was talking to, uh, that talked about the terms, a freezing of the conflict, um, etc. Uh, he lacks any constitutional authority to 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 engage in that. Uh, that is the purview of the presidency, not the military. Um, so right off the bat, from a Ukrainian perspective, it's an absurdity in the extreme uh, that Zeluzhny would be holding that. But now what makes it even more ludicrous is the Russian perspective. Gerasimov has no authority whatsoever to talk to Zeluzhny in that manner. None. And moreover, he definitely can't... Um, you know, agreed to conditions where uh, Russia would accept a border defined by the current uh, military deployments, thereby ceding to Ukraine in a post-conflict reality uh, the right bank of Kherson. That's Russia. That's constitutionally part of Russia. Gerasimov can't negotiate that away. He can't negotiate away the territory in Zaporizhia that Ukraine currently occupies. He can't negotiate away the territory in Donetsk that Ukraine currently occupies. That is Mother Russia, constitutionally. Uh, so Gerasimov should be arrested and shot as a traitor if he's having that kind of conversation because he's not allowed to have it. Um, more importantly, even the president of Ukraine can't make that determination because you can't negotiate away Russia. Constitutionally impossible. Uh, the Duma, the, the Senate would have to agree to, to this, but that could only happen if there was a Russian defeat where Russia, uh, desperate for survival, uh, agrees to do things that um, necessitate their survival. Russia has said that 
It will never do that. You know what Russia would do before they would agree to that? They'd go to nuclear war. That's their nuclear doctrine. So it's just, you know, I respect Cy Hirsch tremendously. He's a good friend of mine. I've known him for 25 years. Um, but in this case, he just has bad sources, bad sources. I mean, you know, Cy should have called someone like me and bounced it off of me uh, or some other Russian expert who would told them this is ludicrous. It's impossible to happen, literally impossible to happen. It can't happen. Um, so the source isn't just wrong. It, 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 you have to question the motives of the source, you know, and I think the motives of the source are clear to um, to sow seeds of doubt in the minds of the Ukrainians and in the Russian people. Again, we're playing this stupid psychological operation where we somehow believe that the Russian people can be lured away from Vladimir Putin. I don't know what part of 80 percent approval rating in the midst of a war that has cost Russia tens of thousands of lives and billions of rubles in the national treasury. I mean, if that cost hasn't pried the Russian people away from Putin, nothing will. Uh, they are with him till the end. Um, and so little stupid, you know, psychological operations like getting a Pulitzer Prize running writer to uh, publish nonsense, because it is nonsense. Uh, but because of the prestige and the stature of uh, Seymour Hirsch, uh, there might be some people who say, well, it has to be true. Well, it's not true. Not even real close to being the truth. Um, but, you know, that's the only thing I can think of is that his source was using Cy Hirsch for a psychological operation um, because it's so far removed from reality as to be absurd, literally absurd. There's not any aspect of that article that rings true to a true expert of Russia or anybody who is familiar with just the reality of it. Russia has won this war. Why would Russia seek to freeze this operation? Why would Russia do anything that is less than demanding the unconditional surrender of Ukraine and the return of all Russian territory to Russia? Russia is not going to agree to a freeze to a line that gives away Russian territory. Uh, Russia isn't going to do something that could only be achieved if it had lost this conflict. Russia has won this conflict decisively. It's over. It's all over, but the screaming, the shouting, and the dying. But that's that's it. So, no, the, the idea that Zeluzhny and Gerasim are holding talks is an absurdity in the extreme. The conflict between Zelensky and Zeluzhny is real. Zelensky was asking for some sort of guarantees in case of having a presidential election in Ukraine. He wanted guarantees that Zeluzhny would not be part of this election, would not participate as a candidate for the presidential election. What's the reason behind this conflict between Zelensky and Zeluzhny? Is that all coming from the outside? Is that something inside their administration? Look, there's been a divide within Ukraine from the very beginning of this conflict. Zelensky is a, an actor playing a role. Zeluzhny is a general commanding troops. One is predicated on fantasy, fiction. The other one's predicated on reality. But the reality of the military role um, can't take hold um, without the fiction of Zelensky. Two, two aspects of it. One, if you're going to call Ukraine a democracy worth defending, as the United States and Europe have, have done so, then you have to sustain the illusion of democracy the illusion of civilian control of the military. And that's that's Zelensky's role. Um, and so he does that. Now, the other thing, though, is this illusion has to be useful to the military. It's Zelensky who has been picked as the face of Ukraine. He was the man of the year last year. Why? Because he's the guy, the new Winston Churchill, uh, the you know, the, the modern day embodiment of all that supposed the, the West is supposed to stand for freedom, democracy, defense against this autocratic dictator who's trying to take over the world. Um, and that he became a symbol through which the West poured money, resources, material, political support. Zelensky was that channel. And that's how he was useful to the military, because the military wasn't going to get the tanks, the armored vehicles and everything without Zelensky. They weren't going to get the money without Zelensky. The military wasn't going to get the tanks, the armored fighting vehicles, the ammunition that it needed because of Zeluzhny. They needed Zelensky to do that. Um, and so Zelensky had a political purpose, and Zeluzhny's military purpose was to take the resources and achieve some sort of result on the battlefield. But Zelensky knew from the start that 
um, this was an unwinnable, uh, you know, fight. I mean, uh, but he also knew that his purpose was to be seen as trying as opposed to actually doing uh, that the the job was to appear that to to create a military problem for Russia that was unsolvable. So Ukraine was never going to defeat Russia. But if Ukraine could create the perception that Russia would never be able to defeat Ukraine, that this was going to become a perpetual war, then you generate political problems inside Russia, which has always been the goal. It's not about Ukraine defeating Russia militarily. It's about Ukraine creating the perception of Russian weakness. And that Russian weakness, therefore, would be used to bring a divide between the Russian people and Vladimir Putin. Um, it's failed. And as a result, uh, the the charade is over. Uh, you know, Ukraine was never going to win the counteroffensive. They were never going to drive the 90 miles they needed to go to capture Melitopol, to sever the land bridge, to retake Crimea, to roll the Russians up in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. That was never going to happen. What they wanted to do was create a situation where the Russians were forced to retreat a little bit, maybe mobilize more, divert resources into a forever conflict that became a political liability. But it backfired. Uh, the, you know, the fact is uh, the defeat of the Ukrainian army, void of any politically, you know, political dividends inside Russia, means that Ukraine has now been defeated strategically. And now the West is questioning the value of continuing to fund this conflict. And so Zelensky's role has been diminished. That's why he's not man of the year this year. Taylor Swift is. Speaks volumes. Um, you know, and, and so now if you're Zeluzhny, uh, you, you do have a sort of a duty and responsibility to the men and women that you lead. Um, and at some point in time, Zeluzhny has to say, what you're asking me to do is um, is untenable. I can't sustain it. I can't accomplish it. We need to go over on the defensive. And you saw the split. Uh, Zelensky was saying, we're going to attack, attack, attack. Why does he have to say attack, attack, attack after the Ukrainians have suffered a humiliation with the failed counteroffensive? Because only by saying attack, attack, attack can he get the West to give him the munitions uh, that makes him politically viable. This is no longer about achieving a result on the battlefield. This is about the the retention of political viability by uh, President Zelensky. It's purely a process designed to prop him up politically uh, for survival purposes. Uh, he's willing to sacrifice hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers so that he can continue to be the president. Zeluzhny is starting to say, that's not worth it anymore. We're not willing to die to keep you in political power. We need to go over on the defensive to retain as much um, military capacity as possible so that we can defend Ukraine against the Russians. Um, or if this war is going to end, at least save as many lives as we can. And so you see this split between the two. And Zeluzhny has used his popularity amongst the uh, Ukrainian people to become a political threat, a potential political threat to Zelensky. And so, you know, Zelensky knows in order to retain the charade of um you know, democracy, that he has to have elections, but he doesn't want to hold elections that he knows he's going to lose. And I think Zelensky recognizes that if he were to run against Zeluzhny in a open, fair, and free election, that uh, he wouldn't be the president of Ukraine. So in order to create the conditions where he would be reelected, he needs to keep Zeluzhny out of office. But at the end of the day, you know, if you take a look, if you go back into April 1945, I keep bringing this up, um, Look at the relationship between Himmler, the head of the SS, loyal ally of Adolf Hitler, and Hitler himself. Um, it was deteriorating uh, to the point where at the end, uh, Himmler was seeking to negotiate uh, with the allies on his own without authority. Hitler ordered him arrested and killed. Um, you know, it, it didn't matter because the Red Army was taking Berlin. So all this garbage between Zelensky and Zeluzhny and all this doesn't matter because none of them matter because Russia's won this war and Russia will dictate an outcome that will guarantee that neither of those men are going to be in power when this thing is done. Their day is over. It's finished. 
One of the areas that the Russian military industrial complex has advanced a lot was the area of drones. New Lancet that it's called Product 53 and the new Geranium. What's the importance of this area for Russians? Well, I think drone warfare has revolutionized um, modern war. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think NATO, the United States, and others have quite figured out just how much uh, the the war has changed. Ukraine knows because Ukraine is on the receiving end and Ukraine is using drones very effectively too. From top to bottom, drones are um, you know, thoroughly integrated into every aspect of you know tactics, operations, strategy. The two drones you mentioned, the Geranium-2, um, you know, it's been upgraded with a jet engine, uh, quieter. Um, it uses composite material. It's painted black, which means that uh, it can be employed at nighttime, um, and it's being employed very effectively. Uh, the 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 Lancet uh, Project Fifty Six is uh, takes a very successful drone system, the Lancet, which you know has since the beginning of the war proven its worth. Um, you know, but they've increased the range. Uh, it now can operate at night as well as day. But here's the big thing: it uh, operates as a swarm of drones. Uh, the Lancet no longer is a single piece of munition fired, controlled, and uh, and brought in individually. It can now be fired um, dozens at a time uh, that in, in a fire and forget mode where they're fired into a region. They coordinate with each other. They share intelligence. They distinguish their own targets. And then they all go in and hit separate targets, um, saturating um, a battle space with this uh, the capability. These, these are game-changing technologies. Um, to to fight the new geranium too, which doesn't cost that much to produce, Ukraine is going to have to activate air defense radars, uh, which are going to be detected by the Russians. They're going to have to fire air defense systems, um, and you know one one uh, Patriot missile or one Iris T missile or one you know uh, you know uh, you know any modern system that the Ukrainians have uh, cost you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars per copy, whereas the geranium two is tens of thousands of dollars. So right off the bat, Russia is bleeding the Ukrainians dry from a fiscal standpoint and from a capability standpoint, forcing them to use assets against a cheaper system, which if they don't shoot down, will hit the target it's going after with devastating results. So they have to shoot it down. In doing so, they expose these systems to newer systems coming in that can destroy these and go in through the gap created to hit strategic targets. It changes warfare, absolutely changes warfare. But where where it's really being, where it gets really interesting um, is what's being done at the tactical level. Um, these, these quadcopters that they're using are not only collecting tactical intelligence, uh, but they're being used to devastating effect to drop grenades and more recently as uh, what they call first-person kamikaze uh, drones, FPV, first-person view, meaning that there's a camera on the front and the drone operator is guiding the drone into a bunker, onto a tank, onto artillery. Um, and there are swarms of these drones operating throughout the theater, uh, inflicting tremendous harm on the uh, on the Ukrainians. They also use them uh, uh, to, to resupply. So as troops advance forward, um, they use drones to bring in ammunition resupply, to bring in food, to bring in, um, you know, medical supplies um, to, to forces that are otherwise would have been exposed, isolated, and subjected to being uh, defeated. It, it's revolutionized war. As units maneuver, they now have drone units that maneuver with them to use these drones as fire support. So drones are being incorporated into the formal fire support planning of a Russian attack or a Ukrainian attack. Um, they Defensively, they have to have anti-drone capabilities, these guns, these jammers uh, that are being used. Um, it's transformed the battlefield. And at this point in time, uh, the Russian dominance is so absolute that the Ukrainians are paralyzed. They, they can't move lest they be detected and killed by drones. The Russians have so many drones now that they're using them against individual Ukrainian soldiers. Um, it's, it's a game changing technology and, um, you know, it's, it's playing a big role in why Russia is winning this war and it's, uh, 
I think, exposing fatal weaknesses in the West uh, because we we aren't prepared to fight this kind of war yet. The other area of tremendous impact is the electronic warfare. Is Russia winning in this battle between the West, between NATO and Russia? Well, um, first of all, we have to recognize this is one of the more sensitive areas, uh, very classified. Uh, the Russians don't like to talk about it too much. So, you know, we, you, you, you know, you can't claim to have, um, you know, absolute knowledge. What we know is a couple of things. One, that the Ukrainians have acknowledged that the Russians are dominating the electronic warfare um, aspects of this of this conflict. Uh, they are preventing the Ukrainians from communicating effectively. That's a major thing, um, jamming. Um, but they're also all the technology that we've given Ukraine, um, the the HIMARS, uh, the ATACMS, uh, the uh, JDAM uh, satellite guided bombs, the um, you know, the storm shadow and scalp missiles from Germany and uh, in England, um, they're all being jammed very effectively by the Russians. Um, the, the Ukrainians can't employ JDAM bombs anymore because the Russians just jam the signal and the bomb goes stupid. Uh, the majority of HIMARS are likewise jammed and, and made stupid by uh, Russian electronic warfare. Um even in the sphere of uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, where NATO and the United States have been providing, um, you know, very effective support to the Ukrainians. Uh, one of the reasons why the Ukrainians have achieved what they have on the battlefield is because of this intelligence support provided real time to uh, Ukrainian units that can deliver artillery or deliver drones or deliver other supporting uh, fires. Um, you know, the but Russia you know, isn't sitting there just saying, okay, well, it is what it is. Uh, strategically, I think there was a, uh, a a European satellite that was put up over Crimea, a lot of cloud cover in Crimea and indeed in Eastern Ukraine and conventional imaging satellites are, um, are not as effective because you, they can't see through clouds. Uh, radar imaging can see through clouds and the uh, the 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 status of radar imaging today uh, in terms of quality you know, quality is such that it can discern items. I think that you know I'm not going to say what the number is, but there's a classified number of what the resolution is, um, and it's it's pretty good. Um, and so radar imaging has you know certain effectiveness, and the the United States is not prone to share its radar imaging technology with the West. Uh, I remember during the Gulf War, um, that product was not shareable with even our closest allies. Um, so I imagine that a similar uh, block on trading that or sharing that intelligence exists. So Europe created its own imaging satellite, radar imaging satellite. And yet when they took an image of Crimea, entire swaths of Crimea were blacked out. I couldn't see through it. Remember, this is radar. It's not clouds. Why couldn't they? Because Russia knew the frequency of the radar and had jammed that area that uh, that was sensitive. They didn't want the radar imagers to look into. They had jammed that frequency and made it impossible to read that that strip. On the battlefield, Russia deploys forward because of the Ukrainian drones. Russia deploys forward and puts up a literal umbrella of electronic warfare defenses uh, that jam um, radar imaging, uh, jam the, the signals of the drones, basically to create this protective umbrella, sort of a, a digital iron dome, so to speak, over these units. Uh, Russia does this better than anybody else. It's all based upon the innovations that have occurred since this war started. Um, so yeah, Russia is dominating in the field of electronic warfare. And I think any American or NATO general would be uh, shocked by uh, how effective uh, Russia is at this and how uh, poorly um, NATO and American forces can operate in this environment. How do you see the experience that the Russian army has gained during this battle? Do we have any other army right now, any other country that has such experience? No, there is no army on the face of the earth that has this experience. The Ukrainian army, um, of course, has experience, but they're all dead. Uh, the people that are uh, fighting today are people who get no training. 
Um, they don't know how to use the equipment. So even though they're involved in the same battles, you can't compare the, the two. The Russians, their experiences it cuts across the board. When they started, they were dealing with a primarily contract-based military of soldiers who had never seen combat. So a lot of mistakes were made early on. That's just natural. It, it, it is what it is. The Russians then mobilized 300,000 reservists. Um, and here's the great victory of this, because the mobilization system was fundamentally broken in Russia. They were in for a rude shock when they tried to, when they sought to mobilize these guys. Um, a lot of corruption, they, they uncovered a lot of inefficiencies, etc. Some regions performed well, others less well, some didn't perform at all. Uh, but Russia learned from this, fixed the problem. And today, uh, in addition to having trained those 300,000, the same system today is absorbing hundreds of thousands of volunteers and training them to a high degree of uh, capability. And all of this training incorporates lessons learned from the special military operation. And so the soldiers that are coming out of the training pipeline have a rough familiarity with what what's expected of them in this new environment. It's not like they were trained in the old way, so they have to learn all the mistakes. They've been educated on the right tactics and operational procedures, et cetera. And there's hundreds of thousands of them uh, who have real world combat experience. Remember, they're fighting against a Ukrainian army that is far more deadly than anything NATO has. Ukraine uses far more artillery than its NATO counterparts. Artillery is the number one killer on the battlefield. Uh, Russia knows how to survive in an artillery intensive environment. So when they, if they ever are called upon to face NATO, uh, Russia will, you know, understand what the potential threat is and how to deal with it. And NATO lacks the, um, the resources to survive in this. We don't have the ammunition. We don't have the tubes. We don't have enough. Um, the Russian military today, uh, you know, a key aspect of any military is logistics, how to sustain itself. Russia today is sustaining um, hundreds of thousands of troops in a full-time combat posture um, logistically with the ammunition they need, with the food they need, with the fuel they need. Russia's perfected this uh, logistical sustainment. Uh, the West can't do anything remotely near this. I don't know how we think if we ever had to fight a war on this scope and scale, we'd be able to logistically support it. We haven't exercised it for some time now. We lack the resources to make this work. It works in peacetime because you can plan and exercise well in advance and pre-stage uh, equipment and it, everything's scripted. There ain't no script in war. It's happening. The enemy gets a vote. And um, if you don't have it, you don't have it. Uh, you know, and, it, and to get it to you when the enemy's interdicting you, you know, so the West can't sustain this kind of fight logistically, which is the end of their maneuver force. Because if you don't have fuel, if you don't have ammunition, um, it's over. It's done. So Russia is by far the most combat experienced military in terms of relevant experience relating to large scale ground combat in Europe, in the world. Um and their troops are, you know, veterans. They have, they 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 have experience that's relevant. Uh, the leadership is very sound. Um, you know, every military in peacetime, and uh, the, sadly, this speaks to the American military as well. Even the Marine Corps, you know, we promote, you know, peacetime warriors, um, the guys who never, you know, look good in peacetime. They 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 they're good at putting. Marines on parade, they're good at ensuring that Toys for Tots is you know, adequately executed. Uh, they're good at, you know, doing any number of peacetime tasks, even those with combat experience. What was their combat experience? Iraq, Afghanistan? I mean, yeah, it was intense for the guys there, but it wasn't anything related, remotely related to what's going on in, in Europe today. So, you know, we have a lot of leaders in the American military that um, if they were subjected to the kind of stresses and strain uh, that large-scale ground combat uh, presents, would fail. Russia had similar leaders. There's no Vladimir Putin has talked about. It. He said, "Yeah, we uh, we went to war with some guys both on the ground and in staff who were perfumed princesses. You know, you know people who were who were there for the wrong reasons. Uh, they weren't there to be warriors dedicated to waging war, and." The system had to weed them out. Russia's been purged of inefficiencies. 
the, 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 the officers they have have survived the crucible of combat. These are very well, t it's like comparing the U.S. Army of 1945 with the U.S. Army of 1942. Rick Atkinson wrote a wonderful trilogy. Um, you know, and, and, and you read An Army at Dawn, the, the first book about, uh, you know, the, the U.S. Army going into North Africa. And you compare the absolute inefficiency of that. And then you read Day of Battle about the final, uh, you know, the end game sta stage of that conflict in Europe. And you look at how professional, how efficient, how murderously efficient the U.S. military had become. And that took three years to do. Um, the Russian military has gone through this. Uh, today, they are a murderously efficient military. They have perfected the art of not just killing, but survival. And you combine those two and you have something that is invincible when going up against a military that has no relevant combat experience. And all of NATO, including the United States, fits that definition. When it comes to the conflict in Gaza and the war in Ukraine, the special military operation, how do you see the contrast, anything in the war in Ukraine that the Israelis could have learned before going in Gaza? Ukraine is a is large-scale ground combat, um, a different kind of war. But there are some lessons. Uh, and and I, I, I come at this question from this perspective. Uh, there are Russian officers who have been involved in this, uh, in, in the conflict from the get-go, um, in, in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, they were involved in um, Mariupol, which was urban warfare. And they have taken a look at the Israeli tactics and they've said, you guys would get slaughtered if you fought the Ukrainians. The Israeli Defense Force would be slaughtered. They'd lose everybody because their tactics are just stupid. Stupid in terms of large-scale ground combat. But the Israelis aren't fighting a conventional military force. They're fighting an unconventional military force. But, you know, the, their, their tactics are stupid, not because they're the wrong tactics, they are, but because they're being executed by a military not trained properly to execute them. The IDF is very sloppy, very sloppy. The concept of security is non-existent. Uh, Hamas is able to pop up, uh, destroy tanks, kill Israeli soldiers, um, you know, armor is going forward unsupported by infantry because the infantry is scared. Um, it, it, you know, the, the Israelis are not a very good military. They're competent to a degree against an enemy like Hamas. But if they fight Hezbollah, and again, the expansion of this conflict that draws in Hezbollah, Hezbollah will outclass them every way. Hezbollah has been preparing for this war. Um, uh, Israel's not ready for this war. Their troops are not motivated. Uh, they will be slaughtered if they go to war against Hezbollah. The only thing Israel has is an air force. Let's put it this way. If you took the Israeli air force out of the equation in Gaza, uh, Hamas would kill every single Israeli soldier there. That's the truth. Because the Israelis just aren't that good. Is the Netanyahu administration looking for capturing Gaza in totality? The, the humanitarian pause was a defeat for uh, Netanyahu. Remember, the Netanyahu government said there will be no ceasefire and they aren't going to um, trade, you know, exchange prisoners for hostages, that they're there to defeat Hamas, defeat them politically, militarily, and they were unable to do that. And uh, the, you know, again, the implementation of the Dahiyad doctrine, uh, this collective punishment, um, and you combine that with, again, we have to deal with another reality here. What Israel knew about Hamas in Gaza is no longer at play. Um, Hamas, when they attacked on October 7th, captured the computer servers containing um, the Israeli intelligence about their assets inside Gaza. So Israel went blind in terms of human resources. Uh, they attacked the Unit A200 signals intelligence platforms. Israel went blind in terms of intercepting uh, communications. So what Israel, what Israel thought they knew about Gaza changed overnight. When they went in on October 7th, 8th, 9th, and thereafter, they're going in blind. They have to uh, start all over. And what, what, how, is, how does Israel do this? Through an over-reliance of um, artificial intelligence, they have a targeting algorithm that they've developed 
uh, where they've linked each house in uh, the in Gaza to a specific outcome for Hamas. It doesn't mean that it, they're going to achieve it, but uh, if you hit this house, this is what it does to Hamas. And they also know that this is how many civilian casualties will be accrued. So there is no, oh, this is collateral damage. We had no idea so many people would die. This is deliberate murder based on target. It's it's called the gospel. I think the Jewish term is uh, hasbara or something of that nature. Um, that's in play today. This is mass murder, mass murder, genocide by the Israeli government against the Palestinian people. And it failed. And so um, it, it failed on a number of fronts. It failed in regards to Hamas, but because it failed so egregiously, the Netanyahu government was under pressure uh, from a domestic audience saying, hey, you're not succeeding. Uh, we need our, our relatives freed. We need the hostages released. The entire world reacted to this uh, collective punishment, this indiscriminate bombing with horror, millions of people in the streets. The United States State Department uh, you know, filed a, um, a a memorandum, internal memorandum, a dissent memorandum, saying the policies of the Biden administration are destroying the credibility and viability of America abroad. Um, and so we started putting pressure. So Netanyahu had to agree to a ceasefire. He didn't want to. This was a political disaster for him. And so he was looking for any excuse to get out of the ceasefire. He found it. They're now back at war. He can't afford to have a second ceasefire. That would be the end of him politically. But he's failing militarily. As we speak, the Netanyahu government is being, the, the, the IDF, I mean, is being defeated in certain areas of Gaza. They've had to retreat from certain areas in Gaza because of the casualties they've taken. Uh, this is hugely demoralizing for their for their military. Um, you know, so Netanyahu is in the, in his government are in a very dire straits um, in terms of you know their domestic political reality. Uh, there, there's nothing they can do to change the fact that Netanyahu's political days are over. He is the problem, not the solution. He will be removed from power, either from pressure from the United States or pressure from domestic or both. But, you know, we, we need to stop talking about, um, when, you know, what Israel wants right now. Israel hasn't doesn't want anything. Netanyahu wants everything. He needs to be removed and a new, more legitimate Israeli government in place that speaks on behalf of the majority of the Israeli population, uh, you know, then can speak about what they want. They may not change their policies. Who knows? Um, but I think, uh, you know, real politic will set in and the Israelis are going to have to make adjustments. Economically, they cannot sustain this fight indefinitely. With hundreds of thousands of reservists uh, mobilized who are no longer participating in the economy, with tens of thousands of uh, Israeli citizens displaced from not only around Gaza, but in the north, forced to be resettled, no jobs. They're living off of the support provided by the Israeli government. The economy is faltering. Hundreds of thousands of Israeli Jews are fleeing Israel for more stable locations. Um, this, this is a strategic defeat, a disaster for Israel, that um, if they can't find the way to defeat Hamas, and I don't believe they can, you can't defeat an idea, an ideal especially one that resonates so strongly amongst not only the Palestinian people, but the entire world. It can't be defeated by Israel. So I, I think the, um, you know, Israel won't get what it wants out of this war. We have to understand that they did not initiate this, this conflict. Uh, they didn't want this conflict. They weren't expecting this conflict. The Netanyahu government um, on October 6th had a policy that was predicated on the normalization of relations with Saudi Arabia, um, the initiation of this new um, economic-based conception uh, that was described by Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden uh, announced it during the G20 meeting in India, talked about the India-Middle East Economic Corridor. Benjamin Netanyahu bragged about it during his presentation to the General Assembly in the United Nations. This was the direction that Israel was going. Israel was also 
under the Netanyahu government, um, making sure that there would never be a, a two-state solution, never be a Palestinian state. Uh, they were in the process of expanding operations uh, to create new settlements in the West, and they thought that they had bought off uh, Hamas and the Palestinians in the Gaza by um, increasing the number of work permits that uh, this perception of uh, new economic viability on the part of the uh, Gazan Palestinians linked to uh, a relationship with Israel, an ongoing economic relationship, uh, would preclude any precipitous actions by Hamas. So when October 7th came around, um, the Netanyahu government is faced with a whole new reality. Uh, and now they're adjusting to, and this reality is 100% security, or I, I mean, I'm sorry, um, po politically motivated. It's couched as a security uh, reaction, but it's political. Benjamin Netanyahu was a politician already fighting for his political life prior to October 7th because of what he had done in terms of um, rewriting Israeli basic law regarding control of the judiciary. It was supposed to be an independent branch of government. And instead, under the new law, it would be subordinated to a politicized uh, Israeli parliament, the Knesset. And the purpose of this wasn't to improve Israeli jurisprudence, but rather um, to prevent the prosecution of Benjamin Netanyahu on corruption charges. So, yeah, you know, hundreds of thousands of Israelis were already in the streets protesting against this man. Uh, the Israeli president had said that the situation was so dire that Israel could be looking at an actual civil war. Um, and then comes October 7th. And so you have this already unpopular prime minister now presiding over the greatest security failure in the history of Israel. Um, this is bigger than 1973 Yom Kippur War. This is a absolute failure on the part of the Netanyahu government, but also Israeli intelligence and the Israeli defense force themselves. Um, and so the entire leadership of Israel is, is at risk of losing political viability, meaning that they should and could possibly be removed from power at any moment. The only reason why they're staying in power is because the Netanyahu government now has declared war or as they have said, war was declared on Israel by Hamas. Um, and if, I mean, if you're in for a dime, you might as well be in for a dollar. So if you're going to go to war with Hamas, now you articulate goals and objectives that reflect this war status. And you say that Israel is going to destroy not only the military aspects of Hamas, the organizational structures of Hamas, but politically Hamas will be eliminated. Hamas will never again rule Gaza. Uh, and if you look at it from that standpoint, Israel has failed across the board. Um, you know, when we take a look at the millions of people who are in the streets around in cities around the world protesting in support of Palestine, they're protesting in support of Hamas. They may not admit they are, but the reality is they wouldn't be there if it weren't for Hamas. They wouldn't be there if Hamas hadn't attacked Israel. And created this uh this this overreaction on, or the opportunity for this overreaction uh it's israel that has done it to itself israel didn't need to um invoke the dahia doctrine uh, named after the west beirut suburb which in 2006 israel flattened as part of a new principle of collective punishment um of that makes sure that any civilian population linked to a political entity that is, uh, you know, poses a security threat to Israel that they will be punished collectively to put pressure on them to pressure their own political entity to stop doing what Israel objects to. It was done against the Lebanese to uh, put pressure on Hezbollah. It failed miserably. And it's been done repeatedly against the Palestinians in Gaza to put pressure on Hamas. This is even prior to October 7th. And it's failed miserably. Um, and it's failing now. Uh, this collective punishment uh, that Israel has undertaken has turned uh, the world against Israel. This is a victory for Hamas. Uh, the, you know, we need to also point out that the Netanyahu government uh, was uh, vociferously against uh, a two-state solution, a Palestinian state, said there will not be one. They believe in Eretz Israel, 
greater Israel or biblical Israel. Um, that, that doesn't include any notion of a Palest of Palestinian statehood. And so right now, the entire world um, is talking about the absolute necessity of a two-state solution. Again, this wouldn't have happened without Hamas. Israel had taken thousands of Palestinians prisoner. They'd taken thousands more prisoner, uh, treated them brutally, uh, subjected them to torture, rape, murder. Um, nobody was talking about putting pressure on Israel to release uh, these prisoners, these hostages held by Israel until Hamas attacked on October 7th and took hostages of their own, which they used as a bargaining chip. Um, this is a Hamas victory, not an Israeli victory. Israel is... Uh, you know, is, is suffering huge political uh, consequences. More pressure is put on Netanyahu daily by the families of the uh, remaining hostages to get their release. Um, and Israel is not destroying Hamas. Hamas military is fighting the Israeli Defense Force to a standstill in many parts of Gaza. Uh, they're inflicting very significant casualties on Israel. Um, and remember, Israel says that their victory is defined by the total destruction of Hamas. And if Israel doesn't achieve that, then Israel has by definition lost. And Israel right now is not achieving this. So the Netanyahu government has achieved nothing. They've made the, the situation even worse for Israel, and they've made it worse for them politically. Um, you know, Netanyahu has a 4% approval rating. Uh, he had an emergency meeting of his uh, war council the other night, um, and he concluded the business without holding... Uh, the things he was putting forward up to vote. The point is Israel's achieved none of its objectives and it's not going to achieve these objectives. These objectives unrealistic and um, the, the Netanyahu government is, isn't doing anything for the legitimate security of Israel. They're doing everything for their own political survival. And I think their days are numbered. Uh, I think pressure is being put on them internally from domestic political opposition and externally from friends and allies, including the United States, who are saying that uh, it's increasingly clear that the problem here is Benjamin Netanyahu and that Benjamin Netanyahu and his right wing coalition government have to step aside, have to get out of the way. When it comes to the situation that Israel was in before October 7th, in terms of the relations with Arab states, with other countries surrounding Israel, how do you see it right now? The fact is, Israel is in very many ways, because of its overwhelming support by the United States, the, the support that it gets from the United States has become a de facto indispensable nation of the Middle East. Um, and you combine that with the reality that with very few exceptions, most nations in the Middle East uh, are not pro-Palestinian. Um, they're not supportive of the Palestinian Authority or the Pal or a Palestinian state. Um, and that Israel had exploited this antipathy amongst the Gulf Arab nations, for instance, amongst uh, Israel's immediate neighbors uh, toward the Palestinians uh, for their own good, uh, leveraging the, the concept of the possibility of a Palestinian state that could never be um, reach manifestation because of the definition. This is the Abrams Accord, what Israel has said about a two-state solution. It's unattainable, unachievable, unrealistic, but it's there on the table. And the Arab nations who claim to be supporting Palestine, but who secretly don't, uh, say, well, Israel has made a good faith effort here. Now we'll normalize Israel relations with Israel so we can get on with the reaping the economic and geopolitical benefits of normalization. Um, that all appears to be on hold, but nothing's fundamentally changed. Um, the political reality of the situation is such that these nations have to take a stance that uh, appears to be supportive of the Palestinian uh, people of a Palestinian state, but they are distancing themselves from Hamas and they aren't cutting off relations with Israel, um, which tells me that if and when this conflict ends and will end, uh, that there is a real risk that these um, the nations that are lining up to support a Palestinian state today will slide back to their previous posture of either indifference or hostility towards Palestine. Um, and this will be to the benefit of Israel. Now, the longer this conflict goes on and the deeper the damage that Israel is doing to itself in terms of its um, how the world perceives it, 
um, could create a new political dynamic, a new political reality amongst these Arab states. Uh, and if that happens, then there will be a Palestinian state. There's no doubt in my mind. But if this conflict is brought to an end and then um, the cause of a Palestinian state goes into endless negotiations by people who really don't have the best interests of Palestine in mind, um, we could find ourselves returning to square one, which then brings up Hamas, which is not going to quit until there is a Palestinian state. Um, and I think that the failure of Israel to defeat Hamas empowers Hamas politically and gives them increased leverage to tell the Arab world, the Islamic world, that we will not go away. We will not quit. We will continue to resist. And that the best way to bring peace and stability to the region is to create a true Palestinian, independent Palestinian state, which includes Hamas as a political entity. You can't make Hamas disappear. If I'm, there were elections in the Palestinian, uh, you know, in the Gaza and West Bank today, I think Hamas would win overwhelmingly. The Palestinian Authority has no credibility. None, zero credibility. Hamas has all the credibility in the world because it's the only, only um, Arab organization that's fighting for the Palestinian people. How do you see the possibility of Hezbollah getting more seriously involved in this battle? Is that possible in your opinion? Oh, of course it's possible. It's even likely uh, given what Hezbollah has done is it has maintained a... Um, extraordinarily high levels of pressure on Israel along the the, the border between Israel and Lebanon. Um, the, the purpose of this was to uh, force Israel to divert resources from Gaza to uh, Lebanon and to put uh, strain, economic and political strain on Israel at a time when it was supposed to be singularly focused on resolving the Gaza crisis. Um, up to 70,000 Israelis have been evacuated from northern Israel. They have to be housed, cared for at the enormous economic cost to Israel. Whatever economic activity took place in the north has come to a halt. Um, you know, so that's an unsustainable reality that Israel can't just allow to occur. And Hezbollah keeps ratcheting up the pressure. Um, Israel right now has confronted Benny Gantz, the um, the minister of war, has, um, has come out and said that uh, Israel has no choice but to uh, turn its attention to Lebanon to compel Hezbollah to withdraw from the border. This is suicidal. Uh, Lebanon is as prepared for whatever Israel is going to do as Hamas was prepared for Israel. Um, and Hezbollah is an organization that has far more military capacity than Hamas. Uh, it will be fatal for Israel to um, to expand this conflict. And I think that's why it might not happen, is that the Israelis know that if they engage decisively with Hezbollah, they will suffer a decisive defeat. And um, that could be very problematic, not only for the Netanyahu government, but for anybody who's joined uh, his coalition, his wartime coalition, like Benny Gantz and others. So it's a very dangerous situation, one where there is an absolute threat of um, an expansion of this conflict to draw in Hezbollah, but also one that the consequences of such expansion are so dire that uh, it might be difficult for Israel to act on it, which is what Hezbollah is betting on, that Israel will make a decision to uh, seek a ceasefire before they make a decision to escalate. Time will tell. One of the countries that is so important is Saudi Arabia. How do you see their policy in Gaza? Are they looking for some sort of sanity, some sort of solution for Gaza? Well, their official position and what their real position is might be two different things. Their official position is that um, they support Palestine, they support the Palestinian people, they support a two-state solution. And therefore, they are opposed to the ongoing Israeli uh, actions. Um, their unofficial position is they were ready to normalize relations with Israel uh, to, um, you know, offset the um, the axis of resistance, um, Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, Iran, the Houthi, uh, pro-Shia militias, 
uh, in Iraq. Yes, um, because of China, Saudi Arabia and Iran had normalized relations. But that doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia is going to roll over and play dead. It is, was not a Saudi surrender. And Saudi Arabia was very interested in ensuring that it uh, maintain a dominant uh, geopolitical position vis-a-vis the Middle East. And they were looking to do that by normalizing relations with Israel and creating the conditions where Israel would be able to um, insert itself into the Persian Gulf region uh, in a way that helped uh, offset you know, Iran's growing stature in these nations that are linked to the axis of resistance. Um, so the, the Saudis are in a very, you know, they're, they're, you know, stuck between the horns of, of a dilemma right now. Um, they can't continue to carry out a policy, which by any stretch of the imagination is pro-Israeli in nature, normalizing relations, bringing Israel into the Gulf region to offset Iranian influence. Um, and they, 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 they can't ignore the new reality generated by Hamas's uh, military operation on October 7th and what's transpired since then uh, by ignoring um, a Palestinian uh, you know, two-state solution. So I think what Saudi Arabia is doing is buying time, saying all the right things, hosting a conference, uh, but doing nothing and uh, waiting to see where the chips finally fall before they would decisively commit. Remember, Saudi Arabia's number one purpose for doing anything is to benefit Saudi Arabia. Uh, so they're going; they're not going to be looking for something that brings about, in and of its own right, a regional peace and security. They're going to be looking for something that benefits Saudi Arabia. It may be something that benefits regional peace and security, but it may be something uh, different. Saudi Arabia has a vision, I think it's, they call it Vision 2030, um, about a new Saudi Arabia, um, new economic realities, new social political realities. And that's the direction that um, you know MBS is taking Saudi Arabia. And they cannot support anything that, um, that threatens that vision because that vision is about a redefining of Saudi Arabia. It's, it's, you know, what its economy looks like, what its uh, geopolitical posture looks like. Um, and that's going to require a lot of money uh, to make happen. And that money won't be there if Saudi Arabia does anything that causes a disruption to, um, you know, its oil-based economy um, or changes, fundamentally changes the, uh, the, the, the balance of power in the Middle East so that Saudi Arabia is compelled to take an action one way or the other. Um, so this is a very, very dangerous situation. And, um, you know, one will can always hope that uh, the Saudis find a way to navigate their way through these troubled waters. I think it's important to point out that um, Israel wasn't the only nation taken surprise by Hamas's attack on October 7th. Saudi Arabia was taken by surprise. And Iran was taken by surprise. Uh, prior to October 7th, Iran and Saudi Arabia were uh, working together uh, to uh, create regional stability uh, based upon, you know, the, uh, the uh, emphasizing diplomacy over military confrontation. Um, they had exchanged ambassadors um, and they were you know, moving forward in a, in, in a very coherent fashion uh, to achieve, you know, their, I think, their collective desire for regional stability. Um, after October 7th, both Saudi Arabia and Iran are struggling to, uh, to catch up to the reality of uh, what, what happened. Uh, Iran certainly doesn't want a larger regional war. Iran doesn't want to be drawn into the fighting. Um, and Saudi Arabia doesn't want that either. Uh, remember when Saudi Arabia hosted the, um, the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic States to a uh, conference, an emergency conference on Gaza, um, Iran participated. The Iranian president has flown to Riyadh and has met with MBS and other 
uh, Saudi officials to talk about the Gaza situation. So I think what we're seeing here is that um, Iran and Saudi Arabia are making sure that whatever transpires vis-a-vis Israel and Hamas, that their relations will remain on track um, in terms of, you know, positive interaction, um, conflict avoidance, um, peacemaking, and uh, joint economic prosperity. So I think you're going to see the the Iranians and the uh, Saudis, um, you know, working together to um, to to keep this conflict contained to Gaza and Gaza alone. It's a very difficult challenge. Uh, look at the Houthi; they've basically expanded the entire Red Sea into a combat zone, um, and 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 the support that um, Iran provides to the Shia militias in Iraq and Syria that Iran provides to Hezbollah. Um, you know, this is this is uh, this is real. Um, but I don't think Iran, neither Iran nor Saudi Arabia are going to lose um, strategic focus. And the strategic focus right now is determined more by uh, the peacemaking of China in bringing about a rapprochement between these two countries than how Iran and Saudi Arabia are reacting to what Israel is doing in Gaza. When this conflict ends, is the Netanyahu administration capable of rebuilding their relations with these Arab nations, Turkey? Is that possible for the Netanyahu administration, or do we have to have a new administration in Israel who's capable of doing such a thing? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that Benjamin Netanyahu is one of the um, all-time great political survivors. And, uh, it, it, you know, people in Israel have been trying to get him out of office for some time now, and yet he somehow manages to land on his feet. Um, so you never want to underestimate uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his, um, you know, his ability to um, control Israeli politics in a way that keeps him in power. Um, having said that, though, uh, his support rate is at 4%. Um, that's that's not sustainable. That's not viable. Um, so there, I believe that there will be a change of government in Israel. Um, I believe it will be sooner rather than later, uh, given the enormous consequences, negative consequences that have accrued since you know the Hamas attack on October seventh. Um, Netanyahu is the problem. He's the man who is asleep at the wheel. And you can't trust him to do the right thing for Israel because what he's trying to do is the right thing for keeping Netanyahu in power. And those two goals and objectives may not coincide. So um, I, I, I don't think that we're going to see a situation where uh, this conflict ends and then Netanyahu steps aside. I think we're going to see a situation where Netanyahu is compelled to step aside and then this conflict ends, and then we find out um, if the world is capable of negotiating good faith about, you know, the the future demarcation between Arabs and Israelis, um, thing, things of that nature. Mm -hmm.